Yeah, here we go. They usually put you at the end of a... Good afternoon. Um, it is really a pleasure to, uh, uh, to welcome our guests today. Um, as you know, the, um, the, the thought behind the Institute of Politics is that uh, uh, there's, there's meaning to politics, that it's not just about whether the blue team wins or the red team wins. It's not just about the personal advancement of the people who are involved, but it's about how we approach our future, how we deal with the problems and the challenges that we face, how we seize the opportunities we face. And uh, at the end of the day, nobody has cornered the market on wisdom, and we all have something to learn from uh, each other. And uh, uh, I will say that the, the guest we have today is someone who I think represents the best of politics. Uh, he's thoughtful, he's authentic, um, and uh, he has uh, earned a reputation uh, through the uh, activities that our introducer will discuss uh, as a uh, problem solver and someone who looks earnestly at the challenges we face and looks for new answers and is willing to challenge the, 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 uh, the status quo. So we're really, really grateful uh, uh, to you. Uh, am I supposed to call you President Daniels? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mitchell, yeah. Mitchell, Mitchell How does it sound? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I get a lot of jokes about it. Yeah. <laughs> and we're grateful to Jody as well for uh, being here to, uh, to lead the questioning. And we're looking forward uh, to your questions. And to formally introduce uh, our guest, I am uh, pleased to uh, introduce Max Friedman. Uh, Max is a first year in the college after graduating from Phillips Exeter Academy in 2013. He took a gap year working in the Senate uh, for Senators Dan Coates and Kelly Ayo. Uh, he plans to major in political science with a minor in Spanish. So that shows a lot of foresight yeah. there. Okay, buena. Uh, so let me introduce uh, Max Friedman. Uh, thank you very much and good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. My name is Max Friedman, and I am delighted to be here today to introduce a reformer in every sense of the word, Governor Mitch Daniels. After serving as the director of the Office of Management and Budget under President George W. Bush, Governor Daniels ran for the governorship of Indiana in 2004, defeating the incumbent, Governor Kernan. Governor Daniel, uh, as governor, Mitch Daniels used his experience to transform the $800 million deficit he received into a $370 million surplus within a year without new taxes. Governor Daniels ended his term with Indiana having earned a AAA credit rating and a 40% reduced debt burden. So Governor Rauner, take note. <laughs> in, in 2011, Governor Daniels enacted some of the most sweeping education reform measures in the country which increased the number of charter schools available and gave Hoosier families more choice and control over their child's educational outcome. Governor Daniels has served as president of Purdue, of Purdue University since 2012. He has focused on promoting STEM programs, including leveraging the pharmaceutical industry in state, increasing the number of students who live on campus, and maximizing student-faculty interactions. Governor Daniels announced a two-year tuition freeze in 2013 as part of his goals to make college more affordable. <coughs> Here to lead the discussion with Mr. Daniels is Jody Cohen. Ms. Cohen is the higher education reporter for the Chicago Tribune. In 2010, she was named the Illinois Journalist of the Year. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Governor Mitch Daniels and Ms. Jody Cohen. Well, we'll get started right away. So Purdue has been making news since you became president with headlines that praise you for, quote, reinventing the public university. Perhaps most notably, Purdue has frozen the cost of tuition for several years. What do you see as your biggest successes from the past two years, and how, in particular, is freezing tuition working out? Uh, first of all, I, I uh, reject the notion that we're reinventing anything. Uh, uh, it's a nice aspiration, but I, I don't. I think that would be to overclaim for anything we've done so far. Um, now, um, uh, many of the things we've done, which to me seem fairly modest and obvious, uh, are still a little unusual in higher ed, and so I, I guess I know why they occasionally <coughs> excite some attention. Yes, a tuition freeze gets a lot of, of has has gotten a lot of notice. I mean, in our university, the tuition had gone up 36 consecutive years, and that's not unusual. 
as uh, David and I were discussing earlier, it's the only thing you can find that's gone up faster than health care cost in, uh, in America. Um, and so, more on instinct than anything else, because I'd just shown up, um, uh, I suggested to our trustees that we ought to freeze tuition. Um, I, I suspected, turned out to be accurate, that we could do that and still um, uh, run a first class university. Um, I, I believed it was, uh, secondly, I thought it was a right thing to do. And we are a land grant school. Remember, you know why those were put there, that to open the gates of higher education to and beyond the elites and uh, beyond the wealthy. And that's still, that's as, to me, as uh, profound a responsibility today as it was when Abe Lincoln and his allies created such schools. So that was a second reason. And third, you know, my business, uh, Life, uh, I, I think, gave me the intuition that this, the whole business model was about to take a change. And that we could, uh, the first principle of marketing, by the way, is to differentiate the product. And that by getting off the tuition escalator, we could differentiate Purdue and uh, possibly catch the attention of even more students and families and so forth. I think that's happened. Our, uh, uh, our application skyrocketed last year, and they're up 10% plus this year, which is counter to the national trend. So um, I think as a matter of principle and as a, as a matter of uh, you know, the business of the school where it's worked out okay, and as a matter, I hope, of, um, of future um, differentiation, I think it's proven to so far to work. And I guess you would say that's the most noteworthy thing we've done. We extended that, that one year freeze for two more. So the students I welcomed in my first year will, those who graduate in four years will never see a tuition increase, which is a, not an answer to the affordability question, but it's a start. You are now, of course, getting copycats to your tuition freeze. The University of Illinois this week could freeze tuition. Mm -hmm. So in terms of differentiation. Sort of. For the new, for new for students, students only, in-state right. students only. It's a start. It's good. Uh, start. Um, <laughs> there's no, there's no uh, you know, patent or trademark right. on anything. <laughs> you didn't copyright it. Yeah. So you just spoke about uh, opening land-grant grant universities like Purdue being there to open the gates of higher education. What if the gates are being closed to more in-state students? So while mm -hmm. Purdue has frozen tuition for in-state students, the number of out-of-state students has risen while you've been president. Mm -hmm. So um, nearly half of this year's freshman class is from outside of Indiana. Il yeah. Illinois seeing similar patterns. Um, what's the right balance between in-state and out-of-state students? It's a great dress rehearsal. Tomorrow morning I have to go down to the uh, state uh, legislature which, which I've studiously avoided since changing jobs. I managed to duck them uh, all the way up till now, but tomorrow I have to go down there and I'll get this question. So uh, thank you for, uh, as I say, the dress rehearsal. <laughs> no, balance is the right question. It's not new. Uh, it hasn't changed too much in the two years I've been there, just maybe by a percent or two, but you're quite right. We have at Purdue, 45% uh, uh, of our students are from elsewhere. We have the largest, uh, along with Illinois, international student body. Uh, just about in the country, and we have more Chinese students than anybody has. Over, so if you came on our campus this afternoon, of our 29,000 undergrads, one in six would be um, international, and one in ten would be Chinese, and uh, 40 odd percent would be from somewhere else. Illinois, by the way, is our number one uh, import state. We're, I always tell all the Chicago area kids, you know, I meet them, hundreds of them. I say, I know why you're here. This is a really good school, and it's uh, close enough to home. You can take your laundry when you want, but it's too far for mom to come down by surprise. They go, yes, Prez, it's, you got it. Um, no, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you how we look at the balance question, and we look at it all the time. Uh, number one, there is no shortage. Indiana is, if anything, uh, has an overcapacity of higher ed slots. It's just the way. It is. We're a state of 6.6 .6 million people. We have two Big Ten universities, two public Big Ten universities, a host of smaller schools and other state schools. And just mathematically, uh, there, are, um, there are lots of places. You know, secondly, if a Hoosier kid who applies has a 
7% chance of being accepted into our system. We have a, some of them we say you can come, but you got to start at Purdue Calumet, or you have to start at Purdue Fort Wayne. But they, you know, there's, they're accepted uh, at a very high rate. And 72% of those who apply to West Lafayette are, do get in. Third, it's a lot harder to get in from Chicago or California or Beijing than it is from Indiana. And the profile of the in-state students is, uh, is not as, it's better than it's ever been, but it's, uh, it's, it's easier to get in. That's, we think, the way it ought to be. Finally, no, no reason to, um, you know, not to say it directly. Um, we charge the out-of-state students 3x. We think we're a great value. I guess they do too. We're out to prove that. We're still a lot more affordable for many of them than the schools in their own state. But it is more than we charge. That's how we keep the tuition under $10,000 for, for Hoosier students, the cross subsidy, which I have no problem with. Hoosier students, parents have been paying taxes for 18 years to support schools like ours. And uh, I think there's, you know, we, Balance is exactly the right question, but I, I hope we have these things in rough balance. I think that'll go over okay tomorrow when I try that. <laughs> it usually does. Um, you brought up the issue of uh, students from China, and that number has been skyrocketing mm -hmm. at Purdue, at Illinois. At Illinois, it's also one in ten freshmen this year were from, are from China. Um, do you think this increase in population has been wise, um, particularly when so many Americans are seeking a college education and also because most of those students from China end up returning to China? Um, I think, again, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not unhappy with the number we have of international students. Uh, I have said, I think we're a little lopsided. Seventy percent of our international students are from three Asian countries. Uh, Korea and India are the others. By the way, it's not new. Peru has a long, long history. There are octogenarians I've met in China who who, who, who came to Purdue University a long time ago. So this is not some recent phenomenon, but it has grown. Um, no, I would like to see, and we're working to encourage more. Uh, I, um, I like having one in six from somewhere else. I, I tell our students, we want you to study abroad if you can. We're going to help you do it. But if you make the effort to know your classmates, uh, you can get a study abroad experience without ever leaving this campus or before you do. Um, I think the issues are we would like to have more students from uh, Latin America, from Africa. Um, you know, we'd like to spread the uh, the uh, demographic footprint a little bit. And the real problem we have is the self segregation of of Chinese and other students. We we work at this, but we have not yet cracked the code in terms of how you make sure to maximize the value of. Um, of students from elsewhere for their sake and for the sake of the, of the domestic students, that they know each other well enough and they learn as much as they could from each other. We're, we're not uh, getting that uh, done to my satisfaction yet. So nationwide, including in Illinois, leading public universities have lost roughly 30% you know, of their state support on a per student basis, um, which is one factor in why tuition for years was going up. How do you propose to deal with this, and how do the state universities maintain the quality of education when there's decreasing state funding and, at the same time, pressure to lower tuition? Um, so, first of all, um, Indiana, by the last measure I saw, was, was third in America in terms of maintaining spending for public uh, education. North Dakota and Wyoming, maybe. A couple of oil states were first and second. So somebody paid attention to this even during the recession. And, and, um, uh, but, but, you know, by any fair measure, for a long time now, uh, by some measures like per student, it's come down. Well, um, I've seen this from the other side of the table. What I saw was the same thing that people see when they look at uh, uh, student loans and Pell Grants and all the rest. More and more, for a long time, more and more money flooded in, public dollars. Uh, universities pocketed the money, didn't do the students much good. Tuition just went up to, uh, to match. And so um, I don't consider it our biggest problem. We said when we froze tuition that first year, this is not conditional on 
the state coming across with some significant increase. We'll find a way. I, my little formulation has been, let's see if we can adapt our spending to our students' budgets as opposed to <laughs> requiring them to adapt their family budget to our spending. Um, so uh, now there are some states, particularly since the recession hit, where the cuts have been so swift and so huge that I sympathize with the people who are running institutions there. But in general, um, you know, it's schools have, it's all very well documented now, vastly expanded spending on things that aren't directly related to a, a better education, amenities and, you know, and so forth, uh, climbing walls and, you know, been a lot of, of, uh, examples of that that we've all seen. You know, I always say to people, uh, remember that you and I were discussing earlier, even as the cost went up, there was no validation that the value of the education was going up. In fact, it worked the other way around. It's an interesting economic phenomenon that, that uh, I said, here's the business you want to be in. And, you raise the price and not, there's not only no, as they say, elasticity, right? Usually you raise the price and customers start to go elsewhere. They not only, you only didn't lose customers, they assumed if it cost more, it must be worth more. I say, who gets to do that? My wife said, well, Tiffany's. I said, <laughs> I, oh, okay, there, but who else, you know? And so, uh, uh, but that, I think that game's over too. And now a lot of scholarship, a lot of public officials and others uh, the president and Arnie and others, you know, everybody's asked, starting to ask the right question. Hey, uh, prove, prove it's worth it. And how do you propose that colleges prove that it is worth it? Hmm. In terms um, of accountability, well, how do they? We're, yeah, accountability, exactly. Um, more novel idea, but it's, it's coming now. Just as it finally came to, began to come, come to the K-12 world, it's coming to higher ed and, no, and none too soon. Well, at, at, we're doing two things. There are probably many more that should be done, but at Purdue, uh, starting this fall, we'll be measuring uh, using uh, the faculty's choosing, but measuring uh, with, uh, with the hope of a well-validated instrument, the critical learning uh, capability of our incoming freshmen, and then we'll measure them again after one year, and we'll measure them again at graduation. Because there's you know, there's been some very interesting scholarship that shows that in many places where that's done, you don't get very many gains. Many students aren't gaining much at all. So we'll do that. And we've already started, um, struck a deal with the uh, Gallup Research Organization, and, and um, uh, this year, first Gallup Purdue Index, which is a measurement of how, our gra how, how college graduates are doing afterward in their adult lives. Biggest benchmark, 30,000 um, uh, uh, people were surveyed. So for the first time, we can, can look in statistically significant ways at how graduates of public schools versus private, uh, by geography, um, slice and dice any way you, look, you like, uh, how, how well these alums are doing, and not just economically, although that's in there, but in the other, what Gallup calls domains of well-being. And, uh, and then we at Purdue, and now 20 other schools have signed up to do this too, then we went out and contemporaneously studied our own alums so we could compare them to this first ever benchmark. And uh, um, in general, we were happy to find that Boilermakers are doing really well compared to the, to the uh, typical college grad, but it also showed us a couple things we could do better when, when we ask what correlates with financial and, and uh, societal uh, success, uh, it, it showed us a couple places where uh, we can uh, improve. So on Friday, President Obama announced the plan that would provide free community college to most high school mm -hmm. graduate, graduates with some conditions, including state support as well. What's your reaction to the President's proposal and can you handicap for us the chances of it actually happening? Well, I like the, I like the direction. Um, I mentioned earlier, as it happens, I proposed this in Indiana. It's one of the, one of the few things, in, in eight years, we got an awful lot of things done. I saw a movie one time, I can't remember the name, but uh, 
what's his face, uh, Costner was this light, great, the greatest lifeguard, right? And somebody has said, is it really true that you saved, you know, 517 people? He says, I don't know. I only remember the ones I didn't. So this is one of the, this is one I didn't. <laughs> but uh, it would have been self-financing, but it was the, it was the same idea. Uh, we were going to, we, we thought we saw a way, we saw a way to endow a program in which we could uh, give every Indiana uh, student two years at a community college, or the, they could take the equivalent to any other Indiana school, Purdue, for instance. So I like that idea. Um, uh, we've got to find ways to broaden um, access or maintain access and raise quality uh, in higher ed. Um, I'm a little skeptical of another massive government entitlement program. This would be Medicaid in the higher ed front. <coughs> Um, and now not to change subjects, but um, uh, when I'm not worrying about student debt, which I, we spend a lot of time on, which I'm happy to tell you is coming down at Purdue University, um, you know, I, I, I point out to students sometimes, uh, even if you're that student with an average $33,000 of debt, I'm not telling you not to sweat it, but you're already on the hook for 10 or 20x that in terms of the national debt that you didn't accumulate, my generation and the one before it did, and um, so I worry about anything that adds to that. By the way, entitlement spending um, is not just a tomorrow problem, it's a today problem. I think it's hurting economic growth right now. It would be much worse, by the way, if we didn't have artificially low interest rates. If, if interest rates were anything near their normal level, the national debt, the deficits in the national debt would be dramatically more than they appear to be. But the, the higher ed angle is that, that as autopilot spending, so Medicare, Social Security, veterans pensions, government pensions, all those things, they're crowding out the ability of government to do the necessary things, the so-called discretionary things, that as circumstances change and new problems emerge, and federal government's got itself painted into a corner where only less than now, a third of the money is available for higher ed, research. This is a proud uh, research university, and so are we. Um, it's squeezing the life out of the, our hopes for growth at the NIH and the NSF and some of those places. And um, so that's, those are reasons that um, I like the goal, but I'm not sure about the means. And as to the probabilities, I don't think they're high. But uh, I'm often wrong about those things. Um, a Gallup survey in October found the percentage of people who believe a college degree is important has dropped to 44%, yeah. down from just down from 75% just five years ago. Yeah. Do you believe a college degree has the same relevance and importance as it did a generation ago? And to what do you attribute the feelings reflected in the poll? Mm -hmm. And I'll throw in one more. What do uh, colleges and universities need to do to change the public's yeah. perception? It is, a, it is an alarming statistic. I, so I've, I've uh, made it a practice. This will be the, my third year, so my third letter, sending an open letter at this time to the camp, our, our campus, so it goes out uh, Wednesday. I cite this number after, after, after citing some other very troublesome figures about declining uh, enrollments and and, and uh, you know, costs and so forth. I said, but the most troublesome one I've seen, and then I cite this very data point, and uh, it's stunning. I mean, I think, you know, David's a public opinion expert, but to see a move of 20 or 30% in just two or three years in anything is eye-catching, and, and to have it in an area so central as this one. So, um, you know, is it, you said, I think, as, relevant or has a, have the same relevance? Well, it's higher education or post, some kind of post-secondary education has never been so necessary as today. That's a commonplace. Um, it may not have the same relevance. Let me, let me say what I mean. For a long, long time, just the credential was sort of a passport. And that's coming under scrutiny now. Because along with many other questions, you know, are students really learning anything on campus and are they studying things that have any meaning later on in life and, 
uh, why does it cost so darn much, all that. Um, you know, a lot of employers and others are beginning to wonder whether these pieces of parchment really tell them anything. And uh, so it may not have the same relevance. Um, you know, this, this university is known worldwide for its contributions in economics. And uh, uh, a lot of times I start uh, presentations. I, people want to hear about this subject. I throw up this first slide, and it's this grainy picture of this nerdy-looking guy standing in front of an ivy-covered wall. Who knows who this is? Almost never does anybody know. I say, okay, well, this is Joseph Schumpeter. He's the Austrian economist who taught the world about creative destruction and how new technologies and new business models can suddenly disrupt and displace. You know, capitalism's never stationary and all that's where progress comes from, but a lot of trouble too. Well, um, a lot of people see that happening in higher ed sometime soon. Some people think that the big earthquake will be when, when people really begin to solve the online issue. And I think that's going to have a big effect. But I think an even bigger one would be if large sectors of the economy, let's say whole industries and so forth, start saying, we can't trust those diplomas anymore. We don't know. That the, everybody gets an A for studying things of suspect value. And we don't know whether they really learn much there or not. And they show up and they turn out to feel entitled and they're not really, uh, really ready for work. So we'll, we'll create our own tests. It's already going on in software. I mean, just think, you know, we have a CPA exam and there are plenty of examples. What happens if large sectors of the economy say, keep your diploma. I want to know, can you pass this test that we set up? And if you can, we'll hire you. Whether you dallied around you know, the University of Chicago for four years or, or not. Now that'd be, one, that'd be a change, wouldn't it? Um, Sorry for a long answer, but you're asking good questions. Oh, good. <laughs> well, I think I get to ask two more and then everybody else okay. gets to ask questions. So um, you brought up online education and you've uh, floated this concept of what you like to call the pajamas test. Mm. Did I get that right? Mm -hmm. um, which is, what can universities do to keep students um, going back to brick and mortar campuses when they can sit at home in their pajamas? Um, how much of a thread, if that's the right word, um, do you think online learning is? And what do you think will be the impact of MOOCs, the yeah. massive online open courses um, in particular? I've, in business, you know, I remember um, uh, someone saying it's it's a cliche I guess now but that it's so uh, the, it, the, the most common strategic mistake is to s correctly spot a trend and overestimate the near term but underestimate the long term and this might be one of those I mean a lot of people have said oh it's just gonna sweep the decks clear right away I don't think so uh, but um, uh, it's already having an effect, and I think it may be a mortal threat to some institutions, depending what they're doing and how they react to it. Uh, so a friend of mine um, is, a, is an academic, and he told me this a few years ago. He said he was at some big meeting of university professors, and one of these Silicon Valley gurus was their main speaker. I won't name him, but you, it's a name you'd recognize. So he comes out, and he's got the look, right? He's got the black pants, black turtleneck, <laughs> and, you know, very dramatic thing, entrance, and he says, uh, First thing I want to tell you is, problem in higher ed is we are not paying the faculty enough money. No, no, no. <laughs> we should be paying a whole lot more money. Yeah. The best professors in America should be paid at least a million dollars a year. They're tearing the walls down. Says, now, I'm only going to need about a hundred of you. Of course, right? And then he goes into this online thing where we're just going to get the best philosophy professor from Harvard and the best computer science professor from uh, MIT and you know, nobody's going to go to University of Chicago anymore. Why? Because you can sit home and get it on the cheap that way. Well, uh, when I talk about the answer in the pajamas question, you know, I, I think that there are tremendous advantages that will be <laughs> extremely, I don't want to be an ostrich about this. And, History's littered with people who said, oh, our, our business is different, our sector's 
not, it's not going to happen like you think. Can't tell you that's not true. But I do think that, that universities, I think it'd be a terrible thing if it did happen. The universities of this country, we've slipped in a lot of ways, at least relatively, as a nation, but we still have the finest universities on the planet. And um, I think everybody involved in one should feel a real duty to make sure that stays the case. And um, I think with the right changes, the residential experience will still provide a value that is going to be very hard to uh, fully replicate in, any, in a purely distributed way. For instance, our Gallup-Purdue index shows a huge advantage if you had an undergraduate research experience. If you had any team-based learning where you worked on long, -term, on long projects uh, for a whole semester or, uh, or, or longer. If you had even one a truly meaningful mentor relationship with a faculty member, things like this. So if you make sure you're delivering that kind of experience, uh, I have to believe that there'll still, and if you keep the cost reasonable, and if you can prove the, that it's working, all those things you have to do in every other good or service you sell, then I have to believe that it will still be a very, very attractive and, and, uh, and additive uh, ex experience that, that won't be fully displaced by whatever, you know, gee whiz technology comes next. But that's what they said at Eastman Kodak, too. Uh-oh. Um, so you taught a class last year at Purdue. Uh, right? This this year. This, this yeah. year. This academic year. Yeah. And I believe it was on World War One. Yeah. yeah, I'm going to teach it again the first, first session's uh, Wednesday night. So I'm sure the students learned a lot, and I'm wondering what did you learn from teaching the class? Yeah, that, that it's hard work. Uh, you know, at least the first time around. Now, if I... If, I, if, if I'd been teaching the same course for 40 years, it probably wouldn't be so hard, but uh, no, I mean, people asked me last year, what'd you do on your, what'd you do over the summer? I said, I studied for my class. Uh, but, uh, and I still am, so it, uh, um, I enjoyed it. I, the, I, I, I really begged them for the evaluations, you know. What, you guys did those here, right? I mean, what's a good percentage return? Uh, you get asked to do one for every class, so I, I think at our school, if you get 40, 50 percent, that's considered pretty good. So I, got, I, I just begged them. I said, hey, I'm a rookie. If anybody needs valuations back up to me, please, you know. Tried to make it easy for them, and I got almost everybody. And uh, yeah, I mean, they, they were very, very encouraging, but they also told me some things. You talk, what did I learn? Uh, I, some things I, I changed for this semester, a little more, uh, it was already kind of interactive, but we're going to give them an extra project or two. I probably dumped a little too much reading on them for a one-hour seminar course. So I made a, some adjustments, but um, I learned that I liked it and uh, that, uh, you know, it's not uh, plasma physics. You can do it if you put the effort in. Can I just uh, start the question? Um, yes. <laughs> so, uh, we were talking uh, uh, before we came in here about the sort of larger implications of making this work, uh -huh. changing the economy. Talk a little, can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, you know, we, you, you mentioned, Jody, the, the, the declining number of people who think a college education is worthwhile, and the, and, 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 and the great... Uh, contradiction is that you, there are all kinds of economic statistics that suggest that if you get a college education, your long-term earnings potential is greater than it's ever been. The gap is yeah. widening. Talk about the implications of, of making this work and making college affordable and making yeah. these colleges relevant to the right. opportunities of the 21st century. Right. Yeah, thank you. I mean, uh, uh, the first thing is um, I I don't accept as a total answer the fact that th these data, when we have plenty of them that say that people with college diplomas earn more, college educations earn more, and the gap is higher and so forth, because that's looking in the rear view mirror. Those are the diplomas that were earned last year and 5 and 10 and 20 and 30 years ago. So it doesn't necessarily tell us what will be the case when you all are out there 10 years. But I, I suspect it won't be too, too different. 
back to one of Jody's questions, the nature of that post-secondary certificate, the uh, uh, diploma credential may change a lot. You may get it from all kinds of different places than we have been getting them, and they may be just as valuable. And that's why I think that initiatives on, with regard to community college and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, adult education, I mean, the, the, the post-secondary, and, and, by the, and for that matter, vocational, uh, what we have always called vocational training, never so important as today. Um, but that, that doesn't necessarily tell you that, uh, I don't think it can be used as a, an argument for saying that people should go to the kind of schools they, we've always gone to and in, in the way we've always gone. Um, but, um, you know, again, as representing a land-grant school, we feel this duty very, very acutely. I'll be in Washington, uh, I guess it's Wednesday, Thursday. Wednesday, um, uh, with what uh, person I consider the uh, person I've learned the most from, Michael Crow at, the, at Arizona State University. Uh, um, he really changed my thinking about certain things. I, let me give you an example. Um, Produce an extremely strong, as we say, STEM school. And standards for admission have been going up, 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 which was probably necessary, back to your in-state question. Yeah, we were taking a lot of in-state kids and they weren't finishing. And that's not the right answer. So when I got there, I was sort of imbued with this thought that we'll just keep on doing that. Keep raising the, <clears throat> the standards. More students will graduate. Stanford of the Midwest, you know, that kind of thing. Still, not, that last part's not a bad ambition, but it is in some tension with our with our land grant heritage. Michael Crow likes to say that uh, our universities should be known uh, not by how many students they turn away, that is how selective they are, but by how many they send out. And I've and he's right. So, our philosophy now at Purdue is. Um, we're going to try to grow our school. We can grow by at least another couple thousand students, I think, without big implications for capital spending and so forth, which is another big issue on college business model. Um, and uh, I'm ready to do that, even if our <laughs> academic profile of entering freshmen flattens out. We'll just take the assignment to use these new tools uh, in what's called student success to continue improving graduation rates and completion rates and so forth and send out more students. That ought to be our goal and it, and it, and it will be. You know, every uh, Purdue alum, especially in our engineering school and some computer, we had the first computer science school in the world, you talk to those folks, they all heard the same thing when they got there, you know, they looked left and right, you won't always, you won't all be here. They had a weed out mentality. And we've said, no, 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 uh, not anymore. We have to have, we have to uh, accept the uh, assignment. I mean, it's primarily the student's job to succeed, but we have to accept the assignment to give them every chance to and help them where we can. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, so while well, the uh, focus of today's conversation has been on the affordability of higher education, I'd like to take a step forward. Uh, one rising and alarming th um, issue is the high, um, highly educated poor people with advanced degrees who still struggle to make a living. Mm -hmm. And there are like many reasons for the lack of tenure track positions and the difficulty of translating academic skills into the real job market. So could you please comment on this issue and are there any possible solutions to it? Thank you. Um, well, I think there are more than one issue, and you, your, your question, I guess, touched on a couple of them. I mean, we have a lot of people uh, emerging with what they, with, with, uh, um, as I say, uh, credentials of some kind that turn out not to translate very well in the workforce, and uh, maybe they were studying things that aren't of particular relevance or meaning. Maybe they weren't pushed to study as hard as I'm sure each of you does, does at this school, as I think we do at our school. And then there's a, another issue, which is the uh, we've 
in, in, in advanced degrees, if you're talking about uh, higher education as a um, career, as a vocation, uh, we've clearly uh, we've got gluts in some areas. You know, I was part of the, uh, I was in federal service um, at the time we doubled the NIH budget, and that was a good thing to do, and I was all in, I was in there pushing for it, even as we were trying to control spending in other areas. Well, it created a huge surge of doctorates in the life sciences. And I now, now I go to meetings where people are wringing their hands because they're not, they call it the LaGuardia, somebody called it the LaGuardia syndrome, all these, you know, circling around waiting for a landing spot <laughs> at the airport that's not big enough. So I think all these things are, um, are in the mix. But um, I guess I come back to uh, if students uh, pay attention, uh, if they're willing to take on the hard subjects, if they're willing to t attend schools like this one, and I promise you ours, where uh, you have to earn good grades, and where there's uh, the kind of rigor we have always associated with higher ed, then uh, I don't worry about those students at all. In fact, I have, I, I have a worry maybe we can get to before we're done about uh, them succeeding so well that they, uh, that you, uh, wind up living in a, a universe that doesn't intersect enough with the rest of Americans. What is the solution to that? If you, you called it the cocooning of, of um, yeah. students or not? Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's a real, it's not that I think, there's plenty of uh, research already available here. What I'm talking about is because, exactly because, back to David's question, because a higher ed done properly does confer more advantages than it ever has on those who succeed at it and do well. Um, I mean, there is a very high likelihood that you, and by extension, your, your schoolmates here, um, are, you're going to get a first-rate education. You are very likely to do well uh, in, in life. You are also very likely to associate with people, probably in marriage, but certainly professionally, socially, and otherwise, who are a lot like you. And we are seeing uh, a, 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 a social, not just an economic gap, which is getting a lot of attention and should, between those in the category I just described and those without, but also a social distance. One of our great scholars wrote, uh, said, it is not a problem if truck drivers cannot empathize with the problems of Yale professors. It is a problem if Yale professors and CEOs and producers of uh, network television shows and you know, these various elites cannot empathize with the problem of truck, problems of truck drivers. And that, that's a corner of all this that I don't think is yet getting quite as much attention as it deserves, but it, it bothers me a lot and I hope it will bother you. You say, what, what's the answer? I mean, I think I've encouraged students, I think I will at the next Purdue commencement. Part of it is you've got to recognize that, it's got to bother you, you've got to make an effort. Life will enable you to settle in happily into the into this world of success. And, and uh, but if you if you really want to be a successful citizen and a contributing citizen, then push yourself somehow out of your, I, I say, into a discomfort zone. And this could be through volunteer activities, it could be through political activities. Join a bowling league or a softball league, you know, attend a church across town, something that gets you out of the, what is probably, you won't even notice it, but you're going to wind up in, if you're not careful, you could easily wind up in, I'll just use the metaphor, a gated community in all of life. So don't let it happen. Um, what about you? In the, with the glasses. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Daniels. I'm a boilermaker. Yeah. I graduated from Purdue in uh, 2013. Well, boiler up. What did you study? Boiler up. <laughs> uh, I'm industrial engineering. Yeah. And I currently study uh, public policy here at Good. the Good. Uh, UChicago. And uh, my question is, uh, 
sort of want to ask you about a comparative study between Purdue and U Chicago. Yeah. From my pers per perspective, you know, uh, Purdue is a big school. Chicago is U uh, Chicago is comparatively small. Mm -hmm. uh, Purdue is public. Uh, U Chicago private. And Purdue, Purdue lean more towards uh, applicable science. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, the uh, University of Chicago is maybe more emphasized on uh, social science and you know basic science. Mm -hmm. So. Um, with all the stuff you mentioned um, in this conversation, what kind of lesson do you think U Chicago can learn from Purdue imme mm. immediately, and uh, vice versa? What kind of uh, you know lesson uh, you, uh, Purdue can learn from U Chicago? Mm. Thank you. Well, I, I, I'm always very hesitant to say that anything that we're doing. Uh, is, what, number one, I don't. I'm not certain that it's. Uh, uh, correct or working, and second, uh, I, I wouldn't presume to say that it's right, even if so, it, that it's right for any other school. I have to tell you that um, in the six months uh, that I had uh, between saying yes to the Purdue job and taking it up, I had this other uh, job to finish, um, I tried to use all my spare time to study up because I, I knew so little about higher ed. Well, one of my field trips was here. And President Zimmer was very gracious and, and spent, I don't know, more than an hour answering a lot of my very naive questions. So as far as I'm concerned, we're still in a learn from Chicago mode. Um, I think your question illustrates how important the uh, variety of our institutions is. We obviously need both kinds. I mean, what a fabulous tradition this place has. and contributions past and present are just undeniable, but uh, you wouldn't want every school to look like that. And I'm very proud, there's so much we can be uh, proud of at Purdue that we were able to do, uh, uh, and, and that our, our graduates have gone on to do, but again, you wouldn't want every, we wouldn't be right for every school to be as STEM focused, for instance, uh, as we are. Um, but the common denominator, as far as I can tell, is uh, rigor, and a commitment to uh, excellence, and as far as I know about Chicago, a commitment to um, you know, um, um, have the doors open to students regardless of background. And um, if, uh, that's, as long as all our universities, whatever their niche or whatever their sector, head in that direction will be fine. About this side of the room, in the back. Um, I'm wondering what's your opinion about or your position about uh, for-profit universities and how can how it is relate with affordability. Thanks. Yeah. Well, I mean, I believe in open competition, and and uh, um, a, a number of these schools are you know they they only I, I'll say it this way. That sector only came into being and, and grew so fast, I think, because of shortcomings in the, in the uh, nonprofit and traditional sector that we had. For instance, uh, older, older uh, students. I'm not completely familiar here but the, with the exact numbers, but you know, the student populations, as you know, only, only one in whatever it is now, four or five college students look like you. 18 to 20 something uh, resident on a campus for four years or something like that. That's, that. that's what everybody carries around that picture in their head. That's what college students are, but it isn't true anymore. It hasn't been for some time. And a vast, I think, majority of the for profit students are people who are elsewhere in life, can't stop and move somewhere and live full time, and there weren't enough viable options for them. And uh, so I, I, I don't think it's right. To, there's some folks who are out to exterminate them, I think, for pretty obviously self-interested reasons. I don't think that's the right answer. You know, we need transparency. People need to understand there, just like at Purdue and everywhere. If I go there and I spend that amount of money, what kind of results uh, am I likely to experience? And so the, plenty of, of those kind of improvements. But, um, you know, um, uh, state of Indiana, again, uh, modest size state, uh, 6.6 .6 million. 
there are three quarters of a million adults who started something post-secondary and didn't finish. Now in terms of getting where David correctly points us to a society with where that where uh, post-secondary credentials are the norm, um, that's a bigger opportunity, frankly, than raising the percentage of 18-year-olds who get there. We we got to do that, of course, but numerically, big advantage, big opportunity, is in this realm of folks who who didn't get that didn't go that route out of high school or shortly thereafter. And so, um, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a very, the most successful online university in this country is called WGU, you've probably heard of it. Originally stood for Western Governors University. I brought them to Indiana, I got involved with them. Uh, it's all online, it's competency based, meaning you you don't wait for a semester and then take a test. As soon as you and your professor, who you may meet face to face, but probably you're just on the phone and emailing with, believe you're ready to take that test in accounting or um, uh, you know uh, marketing or education, whatever it is. You can take it and you can move ahead. Much more affordable. And we brought it to Indiana, and it's now the fastest growing uh, uh, institution there. Uh, average student is 36 years old. And, um, you know, Purdue's not, we're not, they're not going to go to Purdue, they're not going to come here. But, you know, we have to, we have to uh, uh, go that route, or go routes like that. And the, and the proprietary schools have been filling imperfectly, but they have been addressing markets that weren't being well addressed before. Uh, the striped shirt. Oh. Okay, first the striped shirt, then the back. <laughs> question on Indiana politics. Mike Pence wants to expand Medicare and Medicaid. Do you think this will cut into education funding? Okay, well, not Medicare because that's federal, but you're talking about Medicaid? Uh, well, yeah, uh, that's almost right. What he wants to expand is a program that someone else started in 2007, which is a uh, which is a, a program of health insurance for the near poor. And, um, and it's worked pretty well. It, it, is, it is different than Medicaid in some respects, but there's two that matter. When we put it together, I said, uh, uh, first of all, um, it has to be self-financing. We, we doubled the tobacco tax. That was the main means of financing it and remains that way. Second, I said it has to be built on personal responsibility. We know it's not only right, it's efficacious that people have some, as we now say, skin in the game, even a small amount. And when you make something free, people demand it in infinite quantities, and that's one reason Medicaid you know, bankrupts a lot of states. So um, I do, I think it's a good idea. What, what he has said to the... Uh, um, and the conversation with the federal government is, we'll expand Medicaid, but let us, you know, make Medicaid look like the Healthy Indiana Plan. Don't ask us to terminate a plan that's, that's working. By the way, 97 or 8 or 9, last I was there, percent of the people in the plan renew, they like it, they do pay a little bit themselves. They pay into an account, it's theirs. You know, it's like, a, it's like an HSA for poor people. I think it's more consistent with human dignity. I know it's more consistent with keeping health care costs under control because people don't run to the emergency room with every sniffle. They stop and think twice. So I don't know where it's going, but that's, that's the nature of that conversation. And, you know, I, I, I honestly think that our whole health care system, Medicaid and the private side too, is, the faster we could move back in the direction that you take responsibility for your own uh, routine health care, and are protected completely against that terrible event. That's what insurance is, right? You guys understand this, right? You buy auto insurance, it doesn't pay for your oil change and your gasoline. No, it, it, if you have a wreck, it's there. And you, you decide on that other stuff. And we made a wrong turn in health insurance, and what we call health insurance isn't insurance. So that's, that's the nature of that debate. By the way, if you haven't looked at the data, Medicaid is, from a health standpoint, is the worst 
system you can be in. There are studies in more than one state that show that people with no insurance have a whole lot better health status than, and outcomes than the people who go through the Medicaid system. So it needs improvement of some kind. And I, I think, you know, what, what's going on in Indiana is, has some of the right elements. I think you are next. Uh, this is unrelated to the question you just answered. Um, so you've brought up several times STEM initiatives yeah. and applied subjects and stuff. I'm a PhD student in the humanities, yeah. which as a field I would describe as embattled um, with... Uh, what exactly? <laughs> um, no, what, what field exactly? Uh, I do Arabic literature. Yeah, great. Uh, and so, uh, with, you know, as a percentage, undergraduate enrollments are declining, which in a cost-benefit analysis might make sense in terms mm -hmm. of affordability, things you're talking about, funding cuts. I was wondering if you could uh, speak to the sort of position and future of the humanities in higher education. Yeah, well, I'm a product discussion. of the humanities um, and a big believer. And the data say uh, that, uh, um, that graduates of the humanities do very well later in life. Now, um, again, I think it has to been something studied with... Um, with some rigor, but um, um, per se, it's a very important and central part. So not to, so don't uh, uh, you know, leak on me before it gets out. But my, my big, another big theme of my annual letter this year is I found out. No, I guess no one had asked, and it took a long time to dig it out. I said I'd like to know about how many of our graduates. And so, uh, um, studied what I consider at least the heart of the humanities. Great literature, uh, economics, uh, history, maybe, you know, philosophy, social science, you know. So we have, um, even if you're a, a Purdue engineer, you're required to take a certain number of hours, but it's pretty laissez-faire what those are. So I ask, and after they got done digging, it was a pretty disappointing outcome, and so we're going to try to work on this. In other words, it is not acceptable to me that a, that a tiny percentage of the tw our 2014 graduates had even one American history course, even one economics course, even one literature course. Uh, that is no way. We pride ourselves on, on graduating uh, people who will be enormously productive in this most technological um, world we've ever imagined. But we also pride ourselves, and Abe told us to do this, by the way, that we're producing citizens. And um, I don't think we're, because we haven't had our eye on the ball quite enough, we sort of let, let uh, natural courses run their course. I don't think we've done as well as we, we could. So as I, I hope that's responsive to your question. You bet it's important, but not, a, not everything's equally important. And we got a lot of things that we've said, well, that counts as somehow a liberal arts course, but, you know, I don't want to mention any because. <laughs> OK, we have time for one more. Do you want Did you take any lessons away from seeing how your initial estimate of the invasion of Iraq would be less than a hundred billion dollars, and has now grown to more than a trillion dollars? Um, yeah, yeah. Which is Wikipedia cannot be trusted. That's what I took away. So here's the answer to that question, which I've given many times. We were never asked. We were asked this specific, at OMB where we were not war fighters. We were estimators. The question was: There's going to be a supplemental. Uh, appropriation. We said, fine, what are the assumptions? Beat the Iraqi army and begin to withdraw in six months. So we go through an exhaustive thing and produced a number, which turned out to be very accurate. A lot of luck in there. They needed no Patriot missiles, which we thought they would, but they needed a lot more of some other stuff. But we were never at, if the question had been, what will it cost to beat the Iraqi army and stay for 10 years, we'd have given a different answer. So what I learned was the, the, the uh, career professionals at OMB are exactly what I learned, uh, what I saw them to be. Probably the finest professionals in the federal service. Really hard working and really care about getting it right, regardless what, you know, who's president and what the policy is. True government professionals. And they proved it on that occasion. But 
again, uh, if you'd ask a different question, if someone had known or correctly forecast what was involved, we'd have given a totally different answer. Then was the problem in the National Security Council for well, going into Iraq? Uh, sure. I mean, it was believed, looks very naive in retrospect, it was believed that you could take out uh, Saddam, you could find what the whole world, not just our intelligence, but the British intelligence and the French intelligence and everybody believed was there weapons of mass destruction and start moving out. I mean, in that estimate, there was some number, I don't remember exactly what it was now, I, I do remember this, it cost more to bring a soldier home than it cost to get him there. And so there was an estimate in there for bringing out the first few soldiers. You look back and go, well, that was nuts. You know, it, uh, uh, that wasn't going to happen, but people didn't know that then. So. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. This is a great discussion. Yeah. So I, I want to say that you validated my brief remarks at uh, the beginning. Okay. Uh, and, um, you know, we probably don't agree on everything, but I appreciate that you could have done a million things with your life after you left the governor's office and you decided to devote oh, yourself thanks. to higher education. Uh, and that to me reflects the public spiritedness that's to be applauded. And I, and I will say, uh, I was bragging on all of you guys as well, and you guys uh, also lived up to your billing. Can I, I, can I just have this yeah. much time, if not equal? First thing is, well, I want to say is how much I admire this university, and today's a good day to mention because they're going to play this national championship football game tonight, you know, and it's going to make a bajillion dollars, and then now they're going to be paying coaches probably $10 million a year in a couple of years or something. Well, the University of Chicago at the top of its game gave up football in the 1930s, and that was, that, if you didn't know that, that was a, that was a statement of principle that somebody should n you never forget. And, and second, I just want to say that, uh, you know, David has achieved things that uh, you all know about that are remarkable and historic, and, uh, but uh, look where he is. And I know it was the driving force maybe between getting this set up, and I've come to know him as a, uh, as a, a uh, genuinely public uh, interested person, but also just a very decent uh, individual human being, and you probably already know that, but if, if you don't, make sure you get to know him while you're, while you're part of the Institute. Thank you. Well, the, the one question that's left on the table is, in the future, when we have more of this online education, will the national championship be a virtual reality? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let them play Madden against each other. Maybe back yeah. in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Enjoy it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. One final note before all of you leave, I wanted to point out a couple things coming up this week at the Institute, um, most notably on Wednesday night, an outstanding panel conversation looking at the impact of race and culture at the voting booth, the changing demographics, the millennial generation, what does it mean for politics and policy as we look out over the next uh, several years and decades. Ron Brownstein in the National Journal, one of the sharpest analysts on demographic oh, trends yeah. and their impact on I. politics. Um, Ashley Spillane of Rock the Vote. We also have Karen Finney, a Democratic political strategist. Anna Navarro on the GOP side. Rudy Teixeira, moderated by Alex Wagner of MSNBC. It should be an outstanding well. conversation. We hope you're there with us. 6 p.m. at the Chicago Theological Seminary. Spread the word as well. Um, we also have a uh, special advisor for global youth issues at the U.S. State Department, um, Zenit Rahman, beginning her fellow seminar, 4.30 on Thursday. So we hope to see you at all of those and many more events, politics.uchicago.edu. Thank you again, and my thanks again to yeah, thank Governor you. to Jody for a great conversation. Thank you. Say hi to Ron. I haven't